I'm very honored to be asked to uh, come and speak today for the rebirth of the Zoom Digicon Salon. Uh, I see many familiar faces that I'm happy to see, many of whom I probably haven't seen in a long time, maybe more than 30 years for some. <laughs> and let's see, I'll share my screen. Okay. So the thing that brought me to Japan in the summer of 1989 was the Macintosh. As many of you know, uh, Macworld magazine was founded in San Francisco, and we published the first issue on the same day that Steve Jobs announced the Macintosh in 1984. So I was hired by Macworld's founder, David Bunnell, who you see in the, in the corner here. And he was the pioneer behind many of the most successful personal computer magazines in the US, including PC Magazine, PC World, Macworld, and the trade show, Macworld Expo. David was a pioneer in the PC industry. And he first worked with Bill Gates at a company called MITS, M-I-T-S, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and that's the place where Bill Gates founded Microsoft after he wrote his first basic interpreter for the MITS Altair, which was the world's first commercial personal computer. It was by chance that I met David because fresh out of engineering school at UC Berkeley, I worked for the second major PC company. It was a kit and it was called MSI. Sadly, David passed away in 2016, um, so four years ago, but his last work was a book, and it was titled Good Friday on the Res. It was published just after his death, and it was a book about his early years growing up in a small town near the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, where he made many friends and where he returned to write during the last years of his life. I'd like to read a short quote from the opening of David's book, which reminded me of him as I was trying to think back 30 years ago in preparing for this talk. Memory is like riding a trail at night with a lighted torch. The torch casts its light only so far, and beyond that is the darkness an old Lakota saying. So if I go back 30 years, which is not easy to do now, <laughs> in 1989, uh, I was the executive editor at Macworld Magazine, and I was invited to speak at the first Macworld Expo in Asia, which was held in Singapore. So that's the place where Apple had built one of the very first factories outside of the US a manufacturing plant for the Macintosh. So on the way back from Singapore, I decided to stop in Tokyo for several weeks to learn more about the Mac market in Japan. But also I wanted to do some research as I had just begun to organize a conference with Apple Pacific and it was called the Japan Market Forum. And the purpose of that forum was to help the US software developers meet distributors and localization partners so that they could enter the Japanese market. So that trip was also my first visit to the first Apple office in Tokyo, which was located at that time near the Ark Hills Mori building. So it was there that I met Apple Japan's first president, Takeuchi-san, and also Junichi Kawaminami, who I believe is here today on the call. At that time, Kawaminami-san was, he was the first person in charge of Apple Japan's marketing at probably the most difficult time for Apple in Japan. It was a time when most people believed that the Macintosh would never succeed in Japan. But even during that first visit to Tokyo, I sensed the unique culture and spirit that was developing around the Japanese Mac community. And from that experience, I believe that the Mac could change computing in Japan just as it was starting to do in countries all over the world. 
So that was what actually convinced me to move to Tokyo several months later. And I spent the next five years working with some of the most energetic and creative community of developers, marketers, artists, designers, journalists, and user groups, all of whom served as the early supporters for Apple in Japan. So as many of you know, I'm a sansei, a third generation Japanese American. My parents were both Nisei. They were born in the US in San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And my grandparents were both Issei. They were both, both born in Japan and they immigrated to the US in the late Meiji era. So my father's family was from Kyushu near Fukuoka and my mother's family was from Osaka. And growing up in the Bay Area, I would always hear my grandparents speaking Japanese. And probably I even learned a few words, but I never really learned to speak the language. While we grew up eating Japanese food, listening to Japanese songs, and watching Japanese movies, we spoke only English at home. So my parents, like many Japanese American parents, wanted to raise us as Americans in hopes of avo avoiding the prejudice and discrimination that they experienced during the war. So as Takagi-san mentioned, we first met um, with, a, uh, with a drinking party uh, that was kind of a reconvening of the Digicon Salon group, which has been going on for the last 200 meetings. So I don't know how many years, 20 years, maybe more. So when we started talking, Takagi-san invited me to speak. And we, we started talking and we exchanged ideas about a new opportunity to use Zoom so that a group could meet virtually and use real-time translations so that we could talk with people who not only were in Japan, but were anywhere in the world. So over the past two weeks, we've gotten together a small group and we've tried to experiment with live translation and it sometimes worked and, you know, sometimes didn't work because it was an experiment. And the two programs that we mainly used were the speech-to-text webcam overlay for the Chrome browser and UD Talk, which is an iPhone app. So today we're primarily using the UD Talk iPhone app for the translation, which you see at the bottom of the screen. So right now, it's really, a, you know, it's a unique time in history. Uh, for many people, it's a, it's a hard time, but it affects people not only in just one country, but in all countries around the world. So this kind of thing has really never happened before. And the world economy is undergoing major changes because of this. So at the same time, the orders to shelter in place and work from home and the restriction of international air travel has really kind of led to a social isolation. It's kind of a nation-based insular thinking. It's very closed. It's becoming extremely difficult to meet face-to-face, -face, both locally and internationally. However, now is the time when people really need to communicate. And now is the time that people are looking for ways to share and connect. So as you all know, the personal technologies that we have experienced in our lifetime have, have transformed our personal communications. So going back to the personal computer, which we first started with, which allowed text communication, first by terminal programs and then by email, even by connecting to mainframes like CompuServe and NiftyServe. And then of course, mobile phones, we started to use voice mobility anywhere. But it was really not until the internet that we really started to use video and VoIP to start to communicate. And then smartphones allowed us to communicate basically from anywhere using video. But the one thing that really kind of exploded and caused kind of media to expand globally was social media. Because with so many people connected, we have a chance to to do video chats and message with just about anybody on the planet. The number of people that are connected now is pretty much eventually going to cover most of the, most of the, at least the developed world. 
with the cloud, we have what has been around for quite a while and normally is termed video conferencing. But I think because of the COVID virus, we now are experiencing kind of a new type of group, and I'll just, you know, call it a virtual group. So we're living right now in a time when we need more communication, not less. And during this period of COVID, I, I in the types of group meetings and events that are taking place online. And there's a real change in the makeup of pe people that are actually meeting using programs like Zoom. For example, right after the COVID emergency was declared, a small business, like all the small businesses, like restaurants and shops, at least in the U.S., were forced to close. So this was devastating for the owners of those businesses. Immediately, though, in the next week, there was a small media group in New York called Spoon. They organized an online workshop around the topic of survival in the restaurant business. There were speakers that were invited from all parts of the country, and it was hosted by a program called Crowdcast. But it was attended by over a thousand people online. And these were people from all over the world who were in the food and restaurant industry. They, they got together and shared their thoughts and ideas about how they were going to survive during the shutdown. So just like that, in order to solve the, the kinds of huge and complex problems that the world is facing today, we desperately need the ability to share ideas and collaborate directly with people in all fields, not just in government, but in education, in science, in health and medicine, engineering, business, technology, environment, law, literature, art, and the humanities. In order to tackle the complex problems that the world is facing, we need to speak and meet with people of different cultures, different languages, different backgrounds. In order to do this, we need tools that allow for rich multilingual communication and meetings that can be carried on in multiple languages. So with the pandemic, a small company was able to rise and that program and that pro company and program was Zoom. That's, that small company, we experienced a huge growth and quickly, almost overnight, became the market leader. So before COVID, conferencing apps were mostly used only by large organizations like corporations, academia, and government. But immediately, once the COVID isolation began, there were new uses of group conferencing that were appearing all the time. And those were uses that really had never appeared before. Online discussions were taking place among family and friends. Musicians started recording and streaming live performances using Zoom. They used not only Zoom, but Facebook and YouTube people started organizing virtual happy hours. And that was the way that I got connected with, with uh, the Digicon group. So what I tried to do is I tried to kind of diagram what I kind of saw was going on in the market. And it may look a little bit busy here, but the basic idea is that Zoom, because of their fairly simple design and ease of use, and because it's a freemium business model, it allows them to grow and become popular very quickly and occupy kind of this area shaded in blue. So it's really kind of a new market segment and you might call it personal group conferencing. So much like the personal computer opened up computing to individuals, Zoom and programs like it open up virtual groups to individuals. And that in turn opens up the possibilities for new and creative uses for conferencing. So from the diagram, you can see that, you know, group conferencing has kind of split. One side is more toward the personal, one side is more toward small, medium business and larger companies like the enterprise. But if you look at the higher end, normally you don't call that group conferencing, but it, it is a larger group. So if you look at the size of the audience, we go from one to one, 
from 10 to 100, from the, to the thousands when you're talking about enterprise. And then we go to mass market, which becomes millions, up to 10 millions. So one good example recently of a high-end stream technology event was the recent Apple Worldwide Developers Conference, which according to Apple attracted tens of millions of attendees to the keynote. For that event, Apple employed the highest quality production values to create pre-recorded sessions from their amazing Apple Park Circular Headquarters building. It was an innovative use of technology, but the interesting thing was it drew a massive audience. They've, they've never before experienced that large of an audience that were able to tune in to an event like that. So beyond these, these kind of corporate events are even larger possibilities, like major media and sports organizations, event and concert producers, are even now preparing to stage virtual events like live music concerts, live sports events, hosting not tens of thousands, but tens of millions of attendees. And whenever it's held, or wherever it's held, a global event like the Olympics, will likely be streamed worldwide. So one of the things is Zoom has suddenly risen to popularity. It certainly, though, is not the perfect solution to group communications. There are a lot of areas and many areas that, that really are in need of improvement. For example, in this talk today, we're experimenting with two solutions for live real-time translation. But as you know, language translation, especially simultaneous translation is one of the most difficult and complex skills to learn. And while machine generated speech to text has improved tremendously in the past few years, there's still a lot more room for improvement on the translation part of that process. Another area of attention that needs attention is a better way to capture group dynamics and the feeling of being in a particular venue or a meeting space. With Zoom, it's not really natural to see so many faces, especially your own face, displayed in tiny boxes on the screen. So <clears throat> one of the proofs of the amount of development that's going on in this space is that just this week, Microsoft announced a new version of Microsoft Teams. Jaron Lanier, who is one of the world's experts on virtual reality, and who now is working as a Microsoft research scientist, is helping Microsoft to design a new user interface for Teams, which allows faces to be superimposed <clears throat> into meeting rooms. Meeting organizers can change the virtual settings. They can change the type of meeting room that's, that's being used. They can adjust the lighting for the meeting room. And the faces appear side by side without the little boxes. So one of the comments that Gerard Geron Lanier made is that before COVID, a development like this would probably take years and years before it's released. But because of the isolation that was taking place and the number of people that were moving to Zoom, they decided to rush this out. And so this week, they've created this new version, which now has a mode called the Together Mode, which allows you to choose your own conference rooms. And just two days ago, a new product from Phil Libin, it's a product called, mm -hmm. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a new category, but Phil Libin was the creator of the smartphone app Evernote. So the style of presentation that he's now creating works both with Zoom and Google Meet. Phil's company is called All Turtles and it allows the presenter to easily move a presentation in the background to the foreground, and it allows you to blend and mix the image of the presenter with the presentation. It's really quite amazing. Uh, in order, and also, in, or, in addition to displaying just a presentation on a PC screen, you can also display presentation on a smartphone. So what I've tried to do is Try to understand, is there a way that developers 
can actually be more creative and kind of open up innovation in this space. And at first I started to look at the advantages of having an open ecosystem or an open framework or kind of an API that all developers could write to. And that would be ideal, but I don't think that that's what's happening because each developer is creating their own closed meeting space. But just by the fact that we're using these two translation apps, those two apps were created without the help of any of these companies. They were not created, they were created totally independently from Zoom, Google, or Microsoft. And yet they will work with those programs. So developers will always find a way to work outside of a framework, even though there is no API. So just like in the early days of the Mac in Japan, there were several, several third party, uh, what was called front end processors that allowed you to enter Japanese characters much better than the Apple system that was shipped with the system. But one of the most creative examples that I've seen of this here in Japan is, is probably the use of these virtual on-screen avatars. So it's kind of similar to what happens when you use Snapchat. You can draw glasses on your face or put a hat on or, you know, add different accessories to your look. But all those things also were created by hacking the video. It was not created by using any standard API or working with any of these conferencing programs. So finally, the recent introduction of the app, mm -hmm, which I just mentioned, it uses an approach that I believe many other developers are likely to take. And really, it's a great idea. And that is to package, package add-on functionality into a virtual camera that can then be displayed via Zoom, Google Meet, or any group conferencing software. So the thing that happens then is you can build anything into a virtual camera or you can build a lot of different effects. Things like uh, cinematic effects, uh, post-production kind of uh, special effects can all be added that way. When, of course, it requires a lot more processing power that currently we don't, the average PC or the average smartphone probably is not able to handle. But eventually it's gonna, it's gonna come to these devices and so you'll start to see those kind of effects. And the one area that's really gotten a lot of attention over the last few years is the use of augmented reality or virtual reality. So I think those two areas are probably ripe for development and probably can be brought to use in a conferencing situation like this by incorporating it into kind of a virtual camera effect. So to conclude, I'd like to finish by point, pointing out that the changes taking place in the world today are really very massive and they're going to affect our future for a long time to come. Those changes can lead in one of two ways, two directions, either to a world that's more connected or one that's more isolated. So at, that, at times like this, only technology can provide solutions for a more connected world. There's no other way that we can meet. And yet we must be aware that technologies, especially ones like social media, are defined and influenced by the companies that control those platforms. And those companies could be further constrained or affected by governments or politics. So it's vitally important to consider personal technology as a tool for individual and group creativity and expression. And so I've decided to close with the image of Apple's famous 1984 commercial for the Macintosh. This group and groups like this all around the world have a chance to explore, analyze, and discuss what's going on with this new form of group media. But more importantly, in this time of change, to paraphrase the words of Alan Kay, we have an exciting opportunity to imagine a future and then go out and create it. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And will you please, uh, okay, will you please show your face and uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Chrome with speech to text welcome over there? Ah, okay.
Okay. okay. So this is the uh, Chrome speech to text web overlay. Let's see, is it? It's not translating. There. Okay. Yes. So uh, maybe audience can see and um, uh, translation. Uh, English to Japanese and English to English, both. Okay, so this, I'll set it right now. Yeah. So, okay, currently now it's set for English to Japanese. So you okay. see titles mm -hmm. at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Now I can also set it for English to English. Yes. You know, the user interface is a little bit complicated. Yeah, complex, yes. Maybe you, you, you're better to put a, a set your first uh, native language, English. You, you choose Japanese. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's it. That's it in Ego. No, that's it. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. And uh, into English, yes. I don't know, the person <laughs> seemed to be scrolling over. Hmm. For some reason the window is off the screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe you, you can choose uh, French, okay? <laughs> French? <laughs> okay. Oh, it's okay, it's Japanese. It's English. Okay, okay so okay. this is a closed caption that's designed for a hard of hearing. Yeah. Or, or people that are deaf. Yeah. But that it's basically captioning from English to English. Yes. So, uh, audience can uh, see uh, two uh, automatic translation, English to English and English to Japanese. This is the field, I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. Multiple language, we can automatically uh, real-time translation. If we, we can do that, uh, global, uh, every country's people can speak each other, basically uh, citizen level. That will change the world, I think. Thank you. <laughs>